A good baseline assumption to start from in the Western United States, Western North America, is that fire is inevitable. Fire is pervasive. It is part of most natural ecosystems across the planet. Everything on the landscape is going to burn at some point. It might be next year, it might be in 100 years, it could be in 20 years. We had better make fire our servant or it will become our master. Fire is an essential and unavoidable component of forest ecosystems in the West. If you want to look at what a healthy ecosystem is, it has to be an ecosystem with fire because fire has shaped the adaptation abilities of all the plants that exist there. Fire does a really great job of preparing seed beds. It removes the duff and litter and exposes bare mineral soil. And that bare mineral soil is needed by some plant species for their seeds to germinate and take root. Fire also helps keep the forest from getting too dense so that certain wildlife species can forage and nest. It's part of the ecosystem. We've got a memory in a, in a historical basis that has led us to not appreciate how much of a role fire has in a lot of our forests. In most parts of Western North America, it is the single most ecological process that keeps everything in check. It has this dual perception in society that it is both a benefit to the ecosystems of the world, but at the same time it can burn down houses and perhaps kill people. So it's a kind of an enigmatic problem. Fire can be really inconvenient. It can start at inconvenient times. It can pose threats. And so there's a real pressure often to put fires out. We never did embrace the idea that fire is a part of the ecosystem. And we continue to this day to try to suppress all the fires that we possibly can did this quite effectively. In fact, our initial attack, both then and now, is probably hovers between 90, and right now it's 98% ignitions that we're able to put out right at the beginning before they're actually 100 acres in size. Now we have ecosystems that have been adapted to fire, but now exist on the landscape without fire. There were more trees that were growing up in the gaps because fire wasn't killing them. And so we were getting denser forests and these dense forests would be dropping more material on the ground. So if a fire actually grew, it would grow larger. And because there were more fuel, it would be more intense than in the past. We started seeing these forests burn hotter than they probably did historically. Some of those places may not go back to being forest. Some of those places may convert to brush fields, shrubs. We're left with a situation where the only fires that happen are those that we can't suppress because the weather won't let us. The weather's too extreme. But not in wilderness. Not in wilderness where we're letting fire burn as a natural process. Wilderness, the big hallmark of that is it's a place where humans have only a transient role in natural processes. Processes like fire are allowed, to the extent possible, to function on their own without interference. So that has created this wonderful natural laboratory for watching ecological processes play out. We get to watch these natural processes play out in the absence of other confounding factors like logging and roads. We get to see how ecosystems change as a result of just fire. The great thing in the Bob Marshall Wilderness was that in the early 80s, you had a couple of, of policy shifts that allowed some lightning ignited fires to be managed to benefit the ecosystem. And so in practical terms, that means that the fires were not immediately suppressed. Instead, they were monitored and managed and allowed to burn in some approximation of what they would do under sort of natural conditions. And that creates opportunities for science. 
The work that we're doing right now in the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex, we travel deep into the wilderness. We, at some of our sites, we're 30 miles from the nearest road. First, we take burn atlases. They're satellite-derived maps that show us across the landscape when and where fires have burned. And when we use that to inform our sampling, where we actually go out into the forest, into the burn landscape, and make measurements of fuels and of vegetation, we try to reconstruct or estimate what the forest was like before the fire and what the effects of the fire were in terms of what species were killed, the numbers of trees, those sorts of things. Some of the things that we've learned already from earlier work is that the job isn't over after one fire. You really have to have the maintenance of multiple fires through time. Uh, and when you've had a fire excluded from the site for a long time, it takes at least two to bring that site back into sort of a maintainable, sustainable condition. What we're finding is that these past fires actually serve as a fuel break or a fire break and these future fires or these current fires that are running into these old fires often stop right at the older fire perimeter. Fire creates this mosaic on the landscape, a patchwork, and we have mounting evidence that fire has a self-organizing property where over time the system self-regulates. The size and the severity of fires are kept in check. It's a good reminder that if we do not allow these fires to burn, the fires that are going to burn next year are actually going to be bigger had we not allowed some of these earlier fires to burn. So that shows managers the benefits they can get from previous fires and how to use the good ecological work that fire does on the landscape while letting natural processes play out. Where that leaves us today in the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex is with a landscape that is in tune, so to speak, with its fire regime. Some people are gonna look at that landscape and see devastation and a destruction. I look at that landscape and I see a very rare example of a forest ecosystem where fire is doing the things that it needs to and that it wants to. It leads it to a resilient, condition, a sustainable condition, and I think a forest landscape that is better poised than most of our other forests to adapt to climate change and to, to, to adapt to future stressors. All that research has been conducted in designated wilderness. So these wilderness areas have been just a, a treasure trove of information. But those wilderness settings are very, very important if they've had a lot of fires so that we can look at fires in some and get at what we call a fire regime. And that's the real test because no one's really been able to do that. All of U.S. research has been done since the fire suppression era. Just the, the fact that we have now a much better understanding of how integrated fire is in our forest ecosystems, that contributes to the, just the basic understanding of how the systems work and then therefore what are appropriate ways to manage them. Managers are really looking for this kind of information. They want to know what to do with a place that may be out of whack because they've excluded fire for so long. So now this information that's been developed from watching fires inside of wilderness can be used by managers so that they can get those same benefits of fire outside of wilderness. A lot of people over generations have become used to the forest remain green. And a lot of people want to come to see what they consider the natural environment, but they, they've precluded the fact that fire is part of that. And a lot of times when we're trying to manage fire on a landscape level, there's changes to the landscape that are too large scale a change for people to accept. They've been used to not seeing fire on the landscape or seeing the results and effects of fire afterwards. So for a lot of people, recognizing that that's an aspect of wilderness is difficult. And the more that we can allow fire to play its role as nearly as possible in the wilderness, the better we're going to be in the long term. That's a good start, but we have to go beyond that. We need to stop managing fire based on arbitrary boundaries. We were managing them based on wilderness, trying to keep them from what we used to call escaping the wilderness. We have to start recognizing that fire's role 
on the wild land is not limited to wilderness and start managing it with less loss of private property structures as well as less loss of fire personnel. From the 1960s through 2015, we've lost roughly 441 fire personnel trying to suppress fires. And we need to let people know that that's not acceptable, that we can't manage fire except in loss of life, trying to do things that are ineffective. We essentially got to adapt to fire because we're not getting people killed on fires because we want to do stupid things. We're getting people killed on fires because others can't live with fire. I think where we need to go is instead of pushing fire off as long as we can, letting fire into the non-wilderness landscapes, but on our terms. That's gonna require a big paradigm shift in terms of our relationship as a society and as governments with fire, but I, I think we're gonna to have to go there. Fire science in the wilderness has provided a good basis for what to expect and whether or not we're gonna have some models that are gonna help us manage fire and determine when the best time to manage fire is really important. We need some more information from what the impacts have been on the ground so that we can manage for the future. If the work that we're doing in the Bob Marshall Wilderness and other areas on fire ecology contributes in some way to eventually changing our relationship with fire, have a more productive and sustainable relationship with it, then, then I will consider it a success. Mm -hmm.